maximize their impact on the communities and the bottom lines. I personally have a background in artificial intelligence. I both helped lead the AI user group here, and I have a master's degree in AI. Personally, I've actually never worked with language models in a research capacity, but I have worked with generative AI and um, extensively with reinforcement learning. And I wanted to give, um, as sort of a spiritual continuation of my last talk two months ago, some really good intuitions to build on for how artificial intelligence works. Um, so we're going to start off with a little bit of review of what I said before, so if you were there at that talk, I apologize, the start will be a little bit repetitive, but after that we're going to get into um, some things that are a little bit more um, foundational and getting into how you can get a good intuition for these AI systems without having to do too much in terms of like learning in your algebra and figuring out, um, getting college degrees like I did, and you don't have to do all that to have a really good understanding of what so, so we should, I want to be clear that I'm simplifying some things here, simplifying things in a way that hopefully will give you, I'm just going to give up on this. <laughs> I'm simplifying things in a way that hopefully will give you good intuition, so that when you start actually thinking about how to use artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence works, you're starting from a good background as opposed to thinking, you know, oh, it's like a human brain, which I also have a degree in neuroscience, and it makes me cringe whenever people say that, or it's just like, you know, some black box that's magic, neither of those things are true, and hopefully we can give you a really good baseline understanding here so you can think about how to use these tools in both your work and if you're uh, in development, how to think about these tools, so hopefully in a slightly different way than maybe you've been taught. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to come together with the goal of creating the smallest language model we possibly can. So, you know, the trend for language models these days is to get as big as you possibly can. And I think that it's important to understand kind of what is the minimum we can do? What is the laziest we can be and still get something useful? Um, but just for some background, um, two months ago I gave a talk and I talked about how artificial intelligence in general uh, particularly uh, generative models, are all probability machines. So the purpose of a model, or um, like a large language model, or any sort of generative model, almost in every case, is to take some information and give out probabilities. It's a function that takes in information and says this is the probabilities of your outcomes. And if you can phrase your question, your problem, in a way that's asking, what is the probability of my answer, you can use a model for it, which is very, very, very powerful. So it's important to understand that these aren't limited to language, they're not limited to images, they can be anything that you can phrase in such a way that you're looking for a probability of some information giving some other information. For example, this is an, from a language model, this is from a BART model, which is sort of the preeminent open source basis for language models, uh, where if you're prompting the model to fill in the blank one, 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 and then something, uh, the model that you see usually will just show one, but the true output of the model is not just one. It looks at every word in the dictionary, every, technically every token output it has, uh, if you want to get fancy about it, and it gives you a probability for each. And then it can pick which one it thinks is most likely, and usually you add a little bit of randomness to that choice, so it doesn't always give you the same answer. Uh, if you use chat GPT early on, you might remember a feature that allowed you to change how, uh, how specific, how uh, its answers were versus, I think they put it as how creative. That was adjusting the threshold of randomness here. So that doesn't actually have anything to do with the model output itself. It has to do with which one of these options it chooses. So the goal for our, our purposes today is going to be making a probability machine for language just like a large language model. And just for another example, so you realize this does not have to be the end of your sentence. It can be somewhere in the middle. It can be just about anything. So if we say, hey, Hebrew Airport is in the city of, and we want to see what the most likely thing the machine thinks should go in that sixth slot, that city slot, um, actually what it says is most probable there is in the process of, which makes sense, but it's not always going to be exactly what you might put in that spot. 
Again, these are probability machines. They are not truth machines. It's an important thing to realize. Um, so let's set up the basis of our problem for creating a small language model with a very small language. We're going to start with a language that only has two words, hello and world. All right? So, and then if we look at all the different two sentence or two word combinations that we'll call sentences, we can get hello world, world hello, hello hello, and world world, right? That's it. That's all our language can do. We're going to limit ourselves to this case. Um, I promise it'll, it'll be an interesting thing to look at in a second. And it generalizes to any language of any size eventually, but baby steps. Um, so how do we want to how can we think about building a model for a language, right? Well, first, we kind of have to decide what we're actually modeling. So before I told you we need to put this in terms of a probability question, so the question I'm going to be asking is given a first word in our little set here of sentences, so given a hello or a world, what is the probability of getting a second word? So what is the probability of getting world or hello afterwards? And if you think of this in terms of actual speech, you could say, you know, if I say, hi, my name is Jacob, what's the most probable thing that you might answer? Ricardo. <laughs> His name is Ricardo. Yes. So these are the sort of things that you're doing all the time that you're trying to model in a, um, in a algorithm. So that's the first thing we have to do. And just at a very high level, we know we have to have some amount of data. We hear about data all the time. We hear about collecting data being important. So we'll throw that on there. We'll figure it out later. Um, we have to get that into a computer somehow. Um, computers don't speak English or any other language, really. Um, and then we have to get the computer to do the thing we wanted it in step one. So at a very high level, we're not going to worry about the details yet. Um, so. We already agreed that the one thing that we want to do is find the probability of the second word given the first. So hopefully everybody's on board with that. So moving on to the second step for collecting data, we'll just get a whole bunch of samples, right? We'll take whatever, maybe you've got uh, a whole bunch of records of people talking to each other, maybe you've got a whole bunch of transcripts, maybe you've got books, whatever. We'll take a bunch of samples and we won't really do too much with them. We'll just put them into a spreadsheet somewhere. Something like this. And there's two different ways, I think, that you could really go about solving this problem. And the first one is with some fancy statistics. If anybody sat through a math class and seen something that looks like this, or maybe more accurately like this, uh, you might be getting some flashbacks. Um, and the second way is through trial and error. And remember, we're trying to be lazy today. Um, so traditionally, we'd look at something table like this, where we have the words, first word, the second word, the occurrences, and we can do some like maybe Bayesian statistics, figure out probabilities, and we don't want to do that because that's hard. And with, in languages that have, Brad, how many words does English have? Over 300,000. Over 300,000 words that we potentially want to process 10 pages of text. It might not only be difficult to do, it might be literally impossible unless we have infinite time, which we don't. So we're going to be lazy about it. Instead, we're going to take our data, and we're just going to try and use samples from that data to come up with our actual model. But how can we set up the problem in a way that like, kind of makes sense for a baseline? So I'm going to suggest a structure here that looks something like this, where we start with a word, and then we look at our options. Right? So we're going to start with a hello, and we're going to look at our two options, which are hello and more. Right? And then for fun, we'll draw some lines between those. And then every time we take a sample from our little set here, um, we'll draw an initial line between the first word and whatever the second word is. So if we got another hello, we draw another line to hello after that. We got a world, we draw a line to world, and we keep doing that. Right? Simple enough? All right. So if we start this with our whole system, our whole, whole language, we have a structure that looks like this to begin with. And this should be reminiscent of something, somewhat intentionally. Um, so this is what our system looks like. And every time we say, we start with a hello, we're going to start at the hello 
um, node of this graph, and we're going to draw a line to whatever word we end up with. All right, so now there's a second part of this, which is making the data compu computer readable, but we're not going to touch that quite yet. Uh, so if we go from hello to world, we're going to go, let's skip here. If we go hello to world, we're going to be drawing a line from the top to the bottom. Sorry, am I getting too zealous with my clicker? Now, we want a process for doing that. And so I'm going to write these in kind of a funny way. Um, where I'm going to just call one of them one and the other one two. But because I'm a computer scientist, I'm going to write them like this. And because I am um, a bit dyslexic, I'm going to put them in the wrong order in my slides. Um, but the idea here is that we're going to call hello uh, the, this one zero, which we can interpret as roughly like 100% hello-ness and 0% world-ness. And world, we're going to call 0, 1, which we'll interpret roughly as 0% hello-ness and 100% world-ness. Again, this is a simplification of what's going on. But it's a way we can put these, this data into a computer. Because we've only got numbers in a computer. We don't get words. So, and this actually makes things really nice for the process of training our little model. Because then when we have our, we want to draw our lines between hello and world, we have hello, we draw one, and then it's a one zero. And if we get the output of world, it's a zero one, and we just have to draw a line from the ones to the ones, right? So that's nice and easy. So this is actually incredibly close to the process of training a neural network. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it gives you the right sort of intuition of what's happening. You put in an input, you check what the output is against your, your training set of data, and then you reinforce the sort of connections that cause that input to give that out. All right? So in this case, we reinforce the connections that draw from hello then to world if we pull a sample that says hello and then world. And then if we do this a whole bunch of times, we'll end up with a graph that looks something like this, where we have a whole bunch of lines from our hello down to our world, a couple lines from hello to hello, where if we had examples that were going that way, and then a couple lines from the world to hello, and then a bunch of lines from world to world. Right? And this actually matches our sampling set from before. Uh, if we look all the way back here. Um, so we're supposing we've already done that. Initially, I was planning to do that with little pieces of paper, but I couldn't get the printer to work with one. So um, at the time, we actually want to use our model now. All we have to do after we've done this is we have to put in our word, our hello, our one zero, and then we have to count the number of lines that go from, well, really what we're doing is we're multiplying the number of lines that go from our one in, into each node. So we have four lines going from one to world, two lines going from one to hello, and we're going to roughly interpret that as there are four times more likely that we think that this is going to result in the world than it's going to result in the hello. Or sorry, not four times, it's 42, so two times more likely. And so we're going to choose that output as world. And then the same thing goes the other direction. So if we have a world, we're going to draw, count our lines going to world, which is three, and count our lines going to hello, which is one, and we'll end up with this three and one sort of thing. So I'm going to make the argument now, um, which if you're a data scientist, you might disagree with me strongly, that this already is enough to have a pretty good idea of what's going on. It's not magic. There's nothing like crazy going on. We just drew a line every time we picked a sample. And we've gotten this already this OK model at predicting what the second word is given the first word. All right. Now, our universe was very limited. And we haven't really explored how this can be powerful. But um, I want to suppose another example here without changing anything about our paradigm. So let's imagine we end up with a third word that we don't know how to handle. But we have some reason to believe it's roughly equivalent hello-ness and world-ness, if you'll allow me to uh, say that. So we're going to call it a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 on here. And the really interesting thing about this structure is that we can still process that. It might not mean it, admittedly. And in a, in a structure that's this simple, it probably doesn't. But we can process it and get an answer. 
So if you count all those lines and you multiply by our input, we're gonna end up with a 3.5 in world and a 1.5 in hello. And if you notice, this model for everything has given us a world as our second output. And that's reflective of the data we fed into. All right, our data overwhelmingly gave world as our second output. So for inputs, no matter what our input ended up being, we ended up looking at world as our output. Now, in reality, the models are much larger than this. They have a lot more complexity to them. There's a lot more variance in what they can do. Um, but I think that there's a few takeaways you can get from thinking in terms of this and building off a simple structure, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit in a second about more of those nuances, but I just wanted to give a baseline for you to, to imagine what kind of math is happening in the background without having to actually do anything. Um, so why does this matter? And I think the first thing you can learn from a simplified version like this is uh, bias. So if you remember what I just said, no matter what we put into our model, we ended up with world. And the reason was because our sample set that we were taken from had this bias towards world outcomes, where our second part tended to have world as our result. Again, put too many things in this. Um, let's just get there. And I want to give another example of what this could look like and why it's important in a more real world context than just like this imagined language. Uh, we're going to pick a different type of model here. We're going to look at what makes somebody a good basketball player. We're going to try to predict a good basketball player. And I'm going to give you two pieces of information. Uh, and I want you to decide what you think from those two pieces of information is more important. The first thing is what color the person is wearing, and the second thing is how tall they are. Does anybody want to go out on a limb? I want a, a show of hands. Who thinks that being taller is good, important for being a good basketball player? Okay. Now keep your hand up if you think it is more important than the color you are wearing. Okay, so I'm a computer scientist. We're not super well known for our sports knowledge. So I, I wasn't too sure. Um, so I went out and I found that there's this, there's this great source of data that's um, the NBA, right? They record all sorts of basketball statistics. Don't know much about the organization, but they've got this great, this great source of data. Lots of things on player heights, on the colors they wear, all sorts of stuff, right? And so I went and I did some analysis. And I found that the taller a team is on average, the worse they do. And admittedly, this is a very weak statistical correlation. In fact, I'd probably preferably say that there is no correlation here if I'm being rigorous. But I didn't really see anything. If anything, it was worse to be tall. And I found that the best color to wear was green. But by a pretty good margin. Like, yeah, sure, there's some others that are, seem fine. But uh, wearing green seemed to increase your odds quite a bit. And the point here is, I mean, it's a silly example, but the point here is that the data set you're using when you train these sorts of models matter because they're statistical machines. So if you think about the NBA, of course, the reason that the height doesn't matter is because you're not exactly sitting around with children playing in the NBA or with people my height playing in the NBA. There is a threshold. And once you get to a certain point, your skill starts to take over. Right? It no longer matters if you're 6'7 or 6'9. It might matter a little bit. Again, I'm not actually that well versed in basketball. That wasn't a joke. <laughs> Your data set starts at 198. I think it's inches or something. No, that, it's centimeters. That's, centimeters. That's how tall I am. Yeah, all right. So it starts at 6'5. Starts at 6'5. 4 centimeters broad. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's that <laughs> So. Oh, yeah. also, also, don't the shorter players tend to be really good because they have to make up for their height in some way? You, yeah. I, would, I would caution you right now against justifying your data set in that way. Because you can tell a story, and I, this is a good example, I'm glad you said this, I'm not trying to call you up. But you can tell a story to justify your data, and you will always do that. And a good way to tell if you're doing that is to ask if, if the opposite were true in my data, would I be able to come up with a story for that too? So, for example, if I had told you that the shorter, the shorter teams are better, and you say, 
Uh, oh, of course, you know, short teams are better because they, they're making up for their height, they have to be extremely good. Then if I told you instead the taller teams are better, and you, you can at the same breath say, of course they're better because then they can shoot over the shorter teams, then your story is, is maybe not as watertight as you'd want. So be, be careful when you make those sorts of stories. But that's, that's an aside on how to interpret data and data science and when people tell stories about their data. Anyway, but the point of this is that this is not actually, even though it's from the most reputable organization on this data in the world, um, this is not a good representative data set for the game of basketball. Because it's not a data set of everybody who plays basketball. It's a data set of the very best players. So I'm not saying this data is useless. In fact, if you're somebody who's into sports betting, uh, this might be a great data set for you because it would tell you, you know, I should bet on the teams that are good. And some of those happen to wear green. And it might not have anything to do with green. But that might not be what you care about. And I don't actually personally know which data, which teams wear green, so like, but apparently there's probably like two of them, and they're decent. Um, so it's not really, but the important thing here is that like what data set you choose to train your models on really impacts what the models will say, and not necessarily in ways that you'll expect going in. You might think I'm using this great data set of basketball players, and it ends up with this crazy bias against height that you never could have anticipated when you first picked the data set, or would not have anticipated. And this can become a very dangerous thing when you're not talking about basketball players in shirt color, and instead are talking about regular people in skin color. It's a big problem. You really have to be aware of it if you're making models like this. But that's the first thing I wanted us to take away from just this idea of the simplified model where we see that these, the way that we're doing this is we're reinforcing what's in our data set. And it's not a, necessarily a problem with the model. It's a problem with the data you're feeding in. You need representative data. Um, the other thing here is that when we transitioned our data to those ones and zeros, we saw that we could do some pretty cool stuff. We did not have to stick to this one zero representation, meaning world versus hello. We could add in all sorts of other information. Where those words are in our sentence. How long ago they were. We can talk about other words. We can look at words that we've never seen before. So there are all kinds of different ways that we can take advantage of that encoding process, which is what we did. We did a type of encoding um, in order to allow our models to handle things that are more complicated than just words. Um, the other thing is that I wanted to talk about is a little bit of the structure. Um, and this is, gets into a little bit of some of the security questions that come, tend to come up in these talks. Also some of the questions about what's the difference between my training set and my actual data I'm inputting. So if you remember at the end here of our model, we had this structure. And this structure, if you looked at a bunch of outputs from this model, you would say pretty clearly that the data that was used to train this model had a lot of hello worlds and a lot of world worlds in it. So by using this model over and over again, but that said, when we actually put in these words during our execution time, during the time that we were using the model, we didn't change the model. We got rep inferences from what we put into the model. So there's the first distinction is that what we're putting into the model is not behaving exactly the same way as the data we used to train the model. So there's a lot of confusion I find in terms of like, do machine learning models look things up? And the answer is no, they don't. But the, the data is intrinsically in the model. And then when you give it data explicitly, when you have input data like the word world here, then that data is also weighted, in, weighted but it's not, it is an input to the function, it is not part of the function. While the training data has become part of the function. Go for it, Brad. One quick add on this though. A lot of the language model companies will take your inputs and use that as future input for future training. That so is also true. It's, it's not necessarily that you're updating and modifying the actual model in the moment of input, but there is still a security question of, is my input being used for future training? Exactly. And then the other takeaway from that, which is 
almost exactly what Brad's getting at, is that there is this security question where if we hit this model enough times and we say, we give it enough examples and we say, what was the input, what is the output, we can start to get an idea of what data was used to train. We can start looking at it and saying, okay, every time I say hello, it gives me a world, or 90% of the time I say hello, it gives me a world. That means I think that it was probably trained on lots of hello worlds. If you give it information about a person's name, a celebrity's name, for example, and they've shown up a million times in the data set because they're a celebrity, and you're using some image generation model, the most likely outcome for that celebrity's name becomes that person's face. Not because you tried to put their face into the model, or not because of something like that, but because it has become the most probable outcome for that input. Go for it. Uh, how does the data look for like large uh, language models? Because in this case, if you know, like, hello, kind of world, that makes sense to me, but are we essentially taking sentence after sentence and just pushing it to a model? Or is it, what, what kind of ecosystem is that actually? So like, how do we know that the data is representative of the population and it's not biased in a large language model sentence? So um, I think you asked a couple of questions there, but the first one, what do your data look like? Your data actually does look like those. Uh, that's what I, it's a vector. Uh, your data looks like those. those it looks like a, a thing of numbers. What does that mean is, depends on how they set up. My understanding is that they take the same data from the internet and then they vectorize it to whatever process that is and then they start feeding the model to it. Is, is that the right understanding? Or do, do they usually pre-process it in terms of, like I know it's basically moving stop words, but does that include more things to it? Like what kind of pre-processing happens after that's created? So you're not gonna, I mean, it depends on how they decide to make their model. So there are certainly lots of models, and I, I would probably all of the big models at this point are doing some extra pre-processing on, on data before they put them in. Uh, there's reasons for that both in terms of performance and in terms of security concerns. Uh, but um, again, it really depends on how you make your model and what you want to get out of it. And does that usually look like a question and an answer? Or does it look like this is the data, I keep putting it in, hopefully my weights will take to summarize all of that? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by a question and an answer. So whenever you're giving a data, like in this case, you, you gave it hello and then you expected a word. So there's an x axis and there's a y axis and y is predicted for y, right? What would, in a large language model, are we taking the data, then we are pushing that in? Is that all the questions and the expected outcome is the answers? Is, yeah, so you, in, in training data, you'll have a set that you'll use as your inputs and a set that you'll use as, as what you expect your outputs to be given those inputs. And the really cool thing about models is that as they get large, so this one is, is hard to realize, you have these emergent behaviors, which is what they call it, when you start to be able to get outputs that match the patterns of your input-output sets that aren't necessarily identical to the input-output. Right. Um, so you can start processing new information. Right. Uh, but yeah, at a fundamental level, you have an input, you have an expected output, and you train based on that. There are, again, there's a lot of caveats in terms of what we're talking about. There are cases of like certain types of models that you can try to set up so that they're um, self-federated or they do some other way of trying to separate data from each other besides you saying this is the correct answer. Uh, but that is sort of the, probably the simplest and most common way that it's done is that you say, this is my input, this is the output I expect. Um, where do I draw my lines? The second question was, how do you know that the data is a representative data? Like, right now, from what I understand, is that you're just trying to, like, okay, let's, like, I, I think about this, right? You're taking data from the Reddit, which is kind of structured, and then you have your input and output, but how do you know that data is the correct representation of what the real facts are? Is yeah. that someone? If you're open AI, you pay a whole lot of people to sort through a whole lot of data. Um, it depends on, again, this is one of those cases that it's entirely dependent on who's making the model, how much energy they're putting into checking that their data is representative. Um, and that is an entire topic in its own and how to do that responsibly. Um, but it is like, like you said, there is not really, it's, it's very difficult to have anything that you would consider like 
true or correct, especially when you're talking about language. Uh, and so it is, it's a process, and uh, the big language model companies will tell you that that is their main advantage over other language model companies, is their ability to do that process, not their ability to make models. Models are actually pretty easy to make. Um, so, let's see, yeah, so those are like the big, the high level points that I think you can get out of the simplistic view of the model. And again, I don't want you to take this away and think that this is exactly what's happening under the hood. It's, it's not quite, uh, but you don't have to do, if, you, if you're interested at this point, you say, I want to know more about this. I, believe it or not, it does not take a tremendous amount of extra effort to get there. Uh, but this is, a, I feel like, hopefully, some of you who have worked with these models a lot will agree, is sort of a better way to start than to think, oh, this is an impossible black box problem, or oh, it looks at a bunch of data and it trains somehow, and then it comes up with an answer. Um, are there any other questions at this point? Yeah, please. What is a parameter in all of this? Yeah. Because um, we, we hear about language models being trained on X number of parameters or tokens or per, like a, a 10 billion parameter language model. What is that a single node? Is that a single matrix? What is the, what is a parameter in that sense? Yeah, so, um, let's see, how would I, you gotta, so when I use the word parameter, I have to think about how I use it. Uh, when I use the word a parameter, I'm usually thinking about um, a node in the model, saying like this is this is an input, uh, this is a parameter which my model can adjust along with its edges. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what that means is like a model is made up of a bunch of these like feeds, right? Nodes, which we're looking at, and here I'm giving weightings of one to each line here. That's not necessarily the weightings that a real model would have. Again, a real model looks more like. Here we go, and more like this. Um, so when I say a parameter, I usually think of one of these circles and one of the and the lines that it, one of the lines it's associated with. Um, I'm trying to think if that's. I don't actually know if that's a rigorous definition. Um, that's okay. I, I think that's a good enough explanation. Like we wonder what is actually happening when you say I just. They just built a hundred billion parameter language model. Yeah. And I think essentially it's just saying it's the node along with how far it is yeah. from it's, each it's of the like other the number of, that it's connected to. Yeah. So it's like the number, you can think of it as the number of knob, knobs the language model has to tweak to try to figure out what the answer is. So each one of these lines between these, uh, these nodes are knobs the language model can tweak. And um, the more of them it has, in theory, the more powerful the model. So the question that you do is kind of try to design an architecture or a structure and you think about, okay, we can create a monstrosity, the biggest tractor on earth, but we only form in five acres, we only need something like that. Uh, and if you think about trying to transmit maybe data or output, you know, data from uh, a spot way out to a spot in a central area, we need to think about you know, what kind of data we need and how frequent we need to look at it and then having the ability to transmit it to where we're doing this. And so could you comment on sort of the balance of trying to create that architecture with the word knobs <laughs> and, and that process of building an architecture that we can, that is usable and precise enough for trying to accomplish the the task, whether figuring out a precision ag thing or figuring out battery health or whatever it is, what's the balance that goes into that? Um, so this is going to, it depends a lot on the domain, of like what your access to computational power is, as well as like how big does your model actually need to be to get the results that you want. And a lot of times the question is not a straightforward question. Usually the way I've solved it in the past is through trial and error. There are some slightly more robust scientific ways to do it. But generally, um, the size of the model, like you need a certain, a certain size to be sufficient. And there are different ways to try to cut down what that sufficient size is, uh, like reusing your data in clever ways so that you have more 
training data. Um, but the trend has been the bigger the model, the better the model. Hopefully that trend starts to slow down and kind of we find a way to start making these models smaller because the bigger the model, the more energy is required to actually make it work. And the more expensive it is, both in terms of processing and in terms of like the actual computer power you need to run it. Um, so we're trying to curve back the other way and it's, it's really an active field of research on how to do that. And so, but the, in terms of for a specific problem, it depends on the complexity of the problem and, um, or I guess that is the main thing. It depends on the complexity of the problem as to how big a model you need. So good language models are, at this point, incredibly large. And I, I love that you commented on the computational cost of running this type of stuff. The bigger the language model, the more expensive it becomes for you to run through it or to try to find information with simple prompt engineering. That's why RAG has become so popular lately, or tree of thought prompting, because it allows for you to do cheaper computations using the language model without having to, like you can get the same responses without having to spend $10 per prompt or per question and answer or per whatever output you want to get from your language model. You're like the bigger it gets, it's just gonna start being more and more expensive for people to, I mean, yeah, computation is gonna, continue to improve and our friends at NVIDIA are building powerful and more power uh, and more capable machines to do all of this stuff, but ultimately it still ends up costing us a lot of money. To add to what you said about like, wanting to move away from like bigger um, models, uh, we also have to think about like, the fact that um, something that requires that much computation power, so many servers, etc. Um, is going to have a negative impact on the environment. Um, it's gonna, it already is doing that, um, but I think I just saw an article about like, Microsoft has drained an, an entire town water supply in Arizona just to power its AI. Um, and so we have to think about like kind of scaling back and making it more precise, more accurate. So it's like you're doing AI, but you're also being conscious about um, consequences of that. I'm gonna go on for a different tangent. Uh, was this based on the old neural nets? I remember neural nets from like the absolutely. So I the 80s. virtually <laughs> 90s. all and that's 1980s and 90s. <laughs> virtually all of what people call artificial intelligence mm -hmm. at this point is based in neural network models. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Um, like uh, a good example is expert systems. Mm -hmm. um, and like there are other sort of uh, techniques that you can use that also get categorized Most under the system artificial system. Exactly. Separate, yeah, and they get categorized under the artificial intelligence umbrella. But almost always when you see artificial intelligence in the news, they're talking about something that under the hood is, is a normal. Is yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's not a new thing. The new thing is being able to process as much data as we have now. Are there any other questions? Why would anyone want to build their own model? Well, there's lots of reasons to build your own model. Um, one, you could start a business based on it. But if you have a problem that you want to solve, especially a problem that's not, um, maybe not like well trodden, like the, the language problem is one that I would recommend if you wanted to get into language modeling, there is lots of open source spaces for you to go out and find models that people have made that are very, very good. But I mean, there are so many other situations where you might want to figure out what the probability of something uh, is given some other piece of information. So that can be like sound, that can be like tractors figuring out what is the probability that staying straight is the best way to drive my tractor versus turning it slightly to the right or whatever. Um, what is the probability that planting my crops at a certain time will increase the yield? Pretty much any question you can think of, you can phrase in, a, in probability. And uh, any question you can phrase as probability, you can make into a model. Now, Kind of a sticky thing here that I've also been talking around is that 
You don't actually have to do that. There are even some questions that you don't have to phrase as probabilities to make into a model, but that's almost always how it's done. So I was talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago, and I think they're in Geese, they're researching, uh, they're doing sentiment analysis on reports uh, to figure out if people is lying in their reports to look for fraud. Yeah. So that's another example. Yeah, yeah. So he just gave the example of people uh, looking for people who lie on reports, and they're looking for fraud um, in these reports. And yeah, fraud analysis is one of the classic uses of mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of systems. There are quite a few professors in the accounting department currently actively working on that. It's a, it's a pretty tough problem because yeah. fraud tends to be yeah. a rare occurrence in your data set, which makes it kind of difficult for yeah. <clears throat> so, is, what's the in-between between creating your own model and just sticking with what's in an existing model? How do you take, like, what are the models that are most adaptable to tweak without having to start from scratch and build something huge? Well, actually, what I would recommend, um, if you're interested in doing this, is I would recommend going through, uh, there's a program called PyTorch that makes a lot of you have a basis in Python makes this a fairly easy question to answer. And they have a couple, if you go to their website, they have a couple like starter models that they walk you through how to build them. Um, and you will actually be building your own model. Um, but they'll, it's a step-by-step -step sort of process. So then you get a lot of intuition on how it works. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of like, they will not only just give you the thing, but they also have some explanations on, you know, this is what happens at this step. This is why you're doing this. Um, and I think that that's probably the best way to do it, not necessarily to pull some of these models off the shelf and try to tweak it, uh, because a lot of the models you'll find um, that are popular are popular because they're really, really good at something, and when they're popular, really, really good at something, oftentimes they're quite large, um, which can make them uh, difficult to understand and difficult to, to model. But I'm sure there's exceptions out there. I haven't really done a ton of research into that, um, but that's what I would recommend. Let me know if this is out of this conversation, but from what I've heard is a lot of these models work on weights, quite a bit more weight moving, which, yes. which makes it kind of a black box, like in that sense. So you can already really say that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Our model worked on weights. <laughs> these are weights. We said weight four, weight three, weight one, and weight two. Right. And because we have two uh, data sets, data points, that's why it's easy for it. Imagine if you have a huge language. You have to say that my name, how do you know that after my name comes there? Because there's so many ways to deal with. If you knew, what use would your model be? If you knew, what use would your model be? Like, I mean, so this is a question, I, I think, what you're saying, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. But um, what, what he's saying essentially is like, these, when we get to a massive neural network, and we have weights for every one of these nodes, and we've got hundreds of thousands of nodes, how am I supposed to understand what makes the model make a certain, I'm going to say decision, decision is not the word I'm looking for, uh, but give a certain output, given a certain input. Like, how do we unparse that? And there's a lot of reasons you would want to answer that question. Um, for example, we were talking about um, bias earlier. If we identify our model has bias, but we're having trouble identifying the source because it's not obvious in our data set, um, trying to pick apart how you go backwards and you figure out what weights matter. There are techniques to do that in the abstract. For example, um, you can put data in and see what parts of that data is being most highly weighted. Does it necessarily tell you? Uh, because you can have 50 parameters that are weighted quite low that together make a really big impact. Um, but it gives you an idea. Um, but I would make the argument here that in a lot of cases, it's the way that you're asking the question of like, I have an input, I want an output, um, you have to think of these models in almost like a heuristic way, or that is like, as if you were making a decision without thinking about it, without going through some ABC process, because they're not really going through an ABC process. This is, a, this is an equation, right? Um, so it's not saying, you know, if you're doing an image model that's trying to recognize tumors, it's not saying, oh, well, first I look at this part of the image and I try to see if it's dark or if it's light. And then if it's dark, I try to see if it's abnormally shaped and if it's abnormally shaped. 
doesn't do that, right? It is this sort of intrinsic weighting of a whole bunch of different factors together to try to figure out what the probability of output is. So on one hand, there are ways of getting at like what is being weighted highly. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also some amount of like, like sometimes when people ask this question, there's some amount of misunderstanding of what's happening, where your model is not going through a step-by-step -step decision process. You can get, like there are types of programs that do a step-by-step -step decision process, but the value of neural networks in general is that they don't have to do that to give you a very high quality answer. The step-by-step -step decision processes are incredibly difficult to code for uh, complicated decisions. And, and I would add, if you ask any expert doctor, how do you identify a fracture on a bone? They will probably be able to walk you through a step-by-step -step process, but they had to go through so many iterations of looking at that thing, knowing to identify, actually, that's not a fracture, this is a fracture, that's not a fracture, this is a fracture. And they're training themselves such that it just naturally happens. But we can't ask them, what's the weight of all of the decision-making process that you're following to make that decision in your brain? Whereas with the language model, it's explicitly stated, like you know exactly what those weighting systems are in the model. It's just hard for us as humans to comprehend when you're talking about 10 billion different parameters, or even 1 billion parameters, or even 1 million parameters. It's just so much harder for us as our puny human brains can't comprehend the complexity of that, such that we start trying to equate it then to a, a brain, a human brain and how the human brain functions. And I can't tell you like, how I do the things that I do expertly. Far, I'm much worse at it than a language model is. Um, and this goes back to your training set. If you've trained the data it may come up with new, unique ways to approach the problem. Like one problem that we were trying to solve was how do you identify the audience, intended audience from a written piece of text? How do I know who the intended audience is? Well, it may not explicitly state anything about race in there, but it might be a black tech magazine. And that's some of the stuff that we were coming up with is like, oh, actually that is a black, this is written for a black tech magazine even if it doesn't explicitly state any of that stuff. So what are the underlying underlying things of the language that show this is actually intended for that audience? And I'm a linguist, I don't know that way of doing it, but the computer could, and I could figure out what it was looking at. I think the reason I wanted to ask that question is because I keep hearing that, you know, they're moving, they're improving, die to be. And I just don't really understand what that means because I have created these models and then I'm like, okay, now what? Does that mean that I go back, improve my data, and keep doing the same process again and again? Or do I make a new architecture, and if I'm trying to make a new architecture, how do I even think of a new architecture? It's because I don't even understand. Like, I understand, I know what the math looks like. Like, I understand all of it. But then, now what? I have a particular output, I'm not happy with it. What do I change? Is it just going back to the data and changing that, and that's it? Or something else? I mean, there's whole bodies of research around how to improve models without changing your data, how to get the most out of limited data sets, what you can do when you can get more data, how to get the most out of data. Um, so, like, I think that, again, I, this isn't a satisfying answer, but it really depends on the specific case, and it is an active area of research. So, it, like, the answer today could be different than the answer tomorrow. Um, for like ChatGPT in specific and some of these other models, a big part of it is improving and increasing the volume of data. Because um, that's kind of a surefire way to improve your model if you have better data. Um, but yeah, architecture changes are, um, it's not always obvious what makes, an arch what makes something better or, or worse. And once you get to a certain size, oftentimes architecture changes make much smaller of an impact than data changes. Because you don't have a lot of models, I just, is it more like, hey, I have a feeling that I should change this? Is, is it more from experience that you're able to make those calls? Because I've not done so many models, but I mean, I'm assuming that because you guys have done so many models, do you get a, you know, buy for it? Like, you know, when I'm writing a code, I know exactly where my complexity is high and I know what to change. Or how do you do something like that? How do you do I mean, some of it is uh, a feeling. Some of it is like brute force trying stuff and seeing what works. Uh, we, I have, um, one of the things that we often do is we have um, what's called like grid search algorithms. 
which will just try a whole bunch of things and tell us like how each one did. Uh, that's not a very efficient way to do things, but it is a way. Um, much better than doing a trial and error manually, though. Yeah, it is much better than doing it manually. Um, and there are, and sometimes, especially if you understand the problem very well, there are some things that make uh, more sense to do than others. So for example, if your model starts getting very, very large in terms of you have lots of layers, you should probably start thinking about doing some sort of, um, adding some sort of layers that help with recalls, so layers that are like, um, uh, I'm blanking on the term now. Um, but like these layers that re refresh the model on what the actual input data is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so sometimes there are somewhat logical model changes you can make. You say, this is my problem. I think that what's happening is this model is getting too large. My gradients are vanishing. My gradients are exploding. But um, sometimes it's just trial and error. And but this is why prompt engineers make so much money. <laughs> There was something that went a little fast back there. We mentioned stuff about explainability in AI, and I thought it would be nice to spend a little bit more time there. So in this case, like, um, yeah, a doctor may not be able to give you like a decision tree, but they have found that like if the AI at least highlights what part of that X-ray, for instance, it made the decision based on, if it can tell people um, the way to a highest tier, this is what helped me make that decision. Presenting that to doctors has been really helpful. Because without it, they have tended to take the voice of AI as another authority. And so they've done tests where like, they have false positives and so on. And the doctors will want to agree with the AI because they won't want to seem like they're disagreeing with it. But if it will highlight the parts that it used in making that decision, they can say, oh, yeah, that's actually not important. So even though they can't make their own decision tree, they can see when it's wrong. And I think it's the same with what you were saying about natural language. And that's part of why uh, things like ChatGPT have come under so much scrutiny, because we all know what we expect from language. So the hallucinations really bother us. So I'm all for going for more of the explainability of these systems, letting us know more of what their weights are doing. Yeah, absolutely. And in some cases, that could be extremely helpful. So I actually used to work in a medical lab that did diagnostic screening with artificial intelligence. And one of the things we found was that one of our models was, was waiting in the top right corner of every image more than anything else. Because that's where the doctor wrote what the diagnosis was. <laughs> so we didn't ask doctors to do that. That's kind of what they had, just what they were doing in the software, and they didn't tell us. So, and we had no idea, because it, it was in coding. It was in like some, you know, uh, effectively in some uh, number format by the time it got to us. So we just figured it was, you know, dates of birth information or something like that. Turns out it was a diagnosis. So the AI was looking at the answer every time, <laughs> which is completely useless when you're trying to make it the agnostic model. So those things are absolutely useful. The problem with those is they can be very deceptive as well. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, you can have um, massive parts of an image that are um, together make up quite a large portion of the answer, but individually are not weighted highly. So what I guess the way that my PI used to always put it is that um, it's a good way to check the sanity check yourself, but it is not a justification. So even if you're waiting in the correct spots, it does not mean it's considering the correct thing. I was going to say, with the doctor example, when you know what, when someone, an expert, an expert system, uh, you can use a rules-based system instead of a neural network. And the rules-based system basically just goes through and says, now, if it, is it this or that? Okay, go this way. Go this or that. Is it that way? And, and so it would be more a rules-based system than a neural network in those particular instances, I would think. I mean, that's certainly a solution. Yeah. All right, I think we're just about out of time, but thank you guys so much for coming. Um, <laughs> feel free to ask me any questions after this, but otherwise, we're good to go.